me go ahead and say happy Sabbath to everyone. And I hope you are happy. Amen? Amen. We have much to be happy about and thankful to the Lord for, even in such a time as this in Earth's history. I mean, we are living in a very serious, very solemn time. And there's a lot of evil happening in this world, a lot of sin. But my Bible tells me that where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. And so even though we see a lot of sin in this world, I hope we can learn to condition our minds not to fix our eyes so much upon sin, but fix our eyes upon God and His grace and to see that there is an opportunity that has been set before us that we can glorify Him through His grace, through His power in such a time as this in Earth's history with so much wickedness in our world. And therefore, we still have a reason to be happy because God is getting ready to display Himself in a very powerful way. Right now, this looks very much like the devil's world, but God is soon going to display in a most marked manner that this is still his world. And he wants you and I to be part of the instruments by which he's going to make known his power and reflect his glory all throughout this planet. And so I believe that the Lord wants to do something special with us, and that's why we're here this morning. So we're going to have just one more word of prayer. And I'd like to do that upon my knees, so if you would like to, please join me. We can all kneel together, and if you can't kneel, just bow reverently. But nevertheless, let us all pray and let the Lord speak to our hearts. Our loving Father, we are grateful once again for the privilege to hear heaven speak while all the earth remains silent before thee. Lord, we thank you for allowing us to still be counted amongst the land of the living, and after last night's study, I believe we all understand why you woke us up today, and that is that we might give thee glory. And Lord, so we pray glorify yourself even through your Son right now as I speak to your people. Put your words within my mouth, and may all things be unto edification. We ask these things with the forgiveness of our sins. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. While I realize there are some of us uh, here this morning uh, that was perhaps not here last night, last night we went into a very serious, very solemn study and very simple study, and that was talking about the fact that God created humanity for one very single purpose, and that was that we might do what? That we might glorify Him, that we might glorify Him. Did you know our happiness is actually found in glorifying God? Our happiness. You know, a lot of times we, you know, some people, depending on how they've been trained in their religious studies, they can look at God as a very selfish being. They begin to think, like, why does God make us for his glory? Why can't I do some of these things on my own? But you know when Jesus gave a whole lot of counsel to his people, and I'm going to talk about this a little bit later on today, do you know why Jesus gives us so much of counsel and instruction from his word? Do you know why Jesus does that? Does anybody have an idea? Why does he give us so much counsel, so much instruction? Did he, does he give us a lot of counsel and instruction? He does. Why? Because he loves us, right? That's true. I think there's more, though. I think there's more he wants you to know. Go to the book of John, the 15th chapter. When you go to John, the 15th chapter, Jesus actually knows that there's something that all of humanity not only wants but needs. And he shows us how we can get it but I'm just showing you right now where Jesus literally helps us understand why he gives us so much instruction. Why does he give us the counsels that he gives us? The Bible says in the book of John, the 15th chapter. If you're there, please let me know by saying amen. amen. The Bible says in John 15, right there in verse 11, it says, these things have I spoken unto you that what will happen? my joy might what? Remain in you and that your joy might be full. That's why Jesus gives us the counsels and instructions that he gives us. He wants his joy to remain in you because he knows that there's an arch enemy that's always trying to steal our joy. You understand that? Always trying to steal our joy. And therefore, he gives us his words so that if we take heed to those words, if we believe those words, then we are promised that his joy will remain 
and our joy will be full. Do you know what a person looks like when their joy is full? They're joyful. Is that right? They're joyful. And the world needs to see not just a whole bunch of bitter, angry, and resentful, obedient Christians. Are you following that? The world does not need to see more of bitter, angry, resentful, yet obedient Christians. Now, in truth, we're not really obedient. That's an oxymoron. God does, he wants more from you and I than just an external compliance to what he calls us to do. God wants more from us than just a mere acknowledgement of the fact that he exists. I was going through ministry of healing this morning. This, let me tell you, this right here, this is the textbook. This is the textbook of textbooks. And I, I'm very serious when I say that. I mean, of course, we know that our Bible comes supreme. Everything is subject to Scripture. Amen? But when it comes to all these wonderful writings of this little woman by the name of Ellen G. White, I will tell you the truth, that you cannot do yourself a greater disservice than to read all the other books and bypass this one. And the reason I say that is because you'll remember the Apostle Paul said in Philippians 2 and verse 5, he said, let this what? Mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. You remember that? All right. Now, Ellen White actually says in volume 9 of the Testimonies to the Church, page 71, she says the wisdom of the great physician is contained in the book, Ministry of Healing. You understand that? The wisdom of Jesus is revealed in a most forceful and most marked manner through this book, Ministry of Healing. I'm not negating all the other books, but what I'm saying is, is that you will miss tremendous blessings if you study all the other books and bypass this book. Now, in this book, Ministry of Healing, I was going through it, and uh, there was a wonderful point on the subject, the touch of faith. And it was right here that I began to read a point that I just thought to myself, this is too profound to bypass. It was on page 62, and it was talking about the woman who uh, had the issue of blood. And you know the story. She wanted to go to Jesus, but she, he, was crowded, he was crowded in by a bunch of folks, and she knew that she couldn't get to him. So she just got to a place where she said, look, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, she says, I know that I will be healed. Tremendous faith. Tremendous faith. Tremendous faith. Here was, the, here was the commentary on some of these points that I think you and I would do well to consider. It says, to the curious crowd, what kind of crowd? Curious. It says, to the curious crowd pressing about Jesus, there was imparted no vital power. No vital power was given to the people who were just approaching God with curiosity. Do you understand that? Yes. When we approach God with a mere curiosity, yeah, let's see if this thing works. Depending on how we approach God will determine what you get from God. So it says, to the curious crowd pressing about Jesus, there was imparted no vital power. Now watch the contrast. It says, but the suffering woman who touched him in faith received healing. Then it says, so in spiritual things does the casual contact differ from the touch of faith. Now watch this. It says, to believe in Christ merely as the Savior of the world can never bring healing to the soul. Is it a good thing to acknowledge Jesus as the Savior of the world? But here it says, to acknowledge him merely as the Savior of the world will never bring healing to the soul. Never. Going on, it says, the faith that is unto salvation is not a mere assent to the truth of the gospel. Is it important to give an acknowledgement to the truth of the gospel? Is that important? Yes, but it says, the faith that is unto salvation is not a mere assent to the truth of the gospel. True faith is that which receives Christ as a personal savior. Have you ever believed Jesus for others, but you found that the same promises that you can believe Jesus for others, you find it difficult to believe for yourself? You can miss a lot of blessings like that. There's a lot of people who struggle with this, including the man who stands right before you talking to you. There was a time that I could 
encourage people with stage four pancreatic cancer, according to the world, an absolute death sentence. And I can go to them and say, God is able. That which is impossible with man is possible with God, and I can just encourage them. But I found that sometimes I struggled with embracing those same promises when I, for the first time, was facing my own mortality. Amen. We need to understand that God wants us to have a personal faith in Him, something that we can believe for ourselves, not just merely for others. Continuing, it says, God gave His only begotten Son that I, by believing in Him, should not perish but have everlasting life. When I come to Christ according to His Word, I am to believe that I receive his saving grace. The life that I now live, I am to live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You got to personalize the scripture. You got to personalize the text. And so a lot of times we're kind of weighing in the balance. It's like God, he wants to do something special for us, but he can only do it according unto your faith. According unto your faith, be it unto you. And so when we think about the fact that we are created to glorify God, we, we are made that we might give Him glory, that we might honor Him and believe Him and accept His words for us personally, this is how God can begin to give us tremendous breakthroughs. Tremendous breakthroughs. And so last night we again understood that God has raised us up, that we might give Him glory that we might glorify him, that we might reveal his character to a world that is dying in sin. But then we closed our study last night talking about, well, how can we give him glory? How can we get to this place that we can reflect that lovely image and glorify him? Well, the first thing we need to understand is that the same way that when God made Adam and Eve, he covered them with his glory, with his light. So it is in like manner that before glorification, there's some other things that comes. How many of you have ever heard of these three steps? Justification, sanctification, glorification. You ever heard of that? You ever heard of those three steps? Are they, are they in gospel order? Can you glorify God without being justified? Can you glorify God without being sanctified? Well, which one comes first? Justification. So justification is the first step, yes? All right, now the Bible makes it very clear that all of these things are of God. All of these things come from God. So let's go ahead and let's take a look at that from the Bible. Glorification, we've already studied last night, that's something God imparts to humanity from the beginning of time. But let's talk about sanctification. Go to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 1. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, notice what the Bible says setting the foundation just for helping us to understand that these things come of God. In other words, I cannot manufacture this myself. Amen. I can't just make this up. I can't wake up one morning and say, today I'm going to be sanctified. Today I'm going to be justified. Today I'm going to glorify God. It's just not that simple, my friends. Human will is powerful, but human will also has its limits. There are some things that are only within the hands of God, and God alone can make it possible for us. And so it is that the Bible says in the book of 1 Corinthians, we're considering chapter 1, and if you're there, please let me know by saying amen. amen. The Bible says in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, starting at verse 30, it says, But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness, and what else? Sanctification and redemption. That according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in this. The only way I can glorify God is I first must be sanctified. But to be sanctified is something that Christ does in and through us. We cannot manufacture that ourselves. We get that? Is that clear? It is of him in Christ Jesus that he becomes our sanctification, redemption, and the list goes on. Now I'll go to Romans chapter 5. Let's look at it again from the principle of justification. Romans chapter 5. In Romans the fifth chapter, the Bible makes it also very clear that not only can we be sanctified only by Jesus, 
but we can be justified only by Jesus as well. And the Bible says in Romans chapter 5, and we're going to consider verses 16 and 18. When you're there, again, please let me know by saying amen. amen. The Bible says in Romans 5 and verse 16, it says, And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation. But the what kind of gift? The free gift is of many offenses unto justification. Then it says in verse 18, Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. And so it is that justification is a free gift that God gives unto humanity. Now, the reason we're going through this is because there will be no one that will glorify God that has not been sanctified by God. But there'll be no one who has been sanctified by God until we've been what? Justified by God. So first things first, if we're really going to give God glory, we must understand something about justification by faith. Are you following? You see, those who give the blessed herald and loud cry of the third angel's message, they're going to be individuals that not just know intellectually, but practically have had an experience in true biblical justification by which Christ sanctified them, by which God will now glorify himself through them. You understand that? So if we are going to put ourselves in a position that we can glorify God in all that we eat, all that we drink, in all that we do, then we need to understand something about being sanctified by God. We need to understand something about being justified by God. And the good news is, is that it all comes by faith. It all comes by faith. Justification by faith. Sanctification by faith. Glorification by faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. This is very important for the quote-unquote what we call present truth world. There's a, there's a world in the Seventh-day Adventist church that's called present truth. And I tell you the truth, brothers and sisters, if ever there was a need to study what present truth is, I believe we need to study that. Because there are a lot of people calling themselves present truth that I'm discovering by their dialogue they know nothing about present truth. And I speak from experience. There's, there were times in my life that I used to say, the present truth. And I really thought I, was, I knew what I was talking about. I didn't know what I was talking about. And so God wants to make sure that we really understand that because sometimes we use terms and cliches in Adventism and sometimes we really don't know what we're talking about. Amen. There is no way that the work of God on earth will ever be finished until we know what justification, sanctification, and glorification by faith in Jesus Christ is all about. Amen. We just won't have it. One day Jesus made a statement, and the statement was very powerful. Go to Matthew, the 11th chapter. I want you to see what he said. Matthew, the 11th chapter. How can we really get to a place that we can glorify God? We know it's our duty. We know it's our calling. We know that it's what God wants. Well, that's pretty clear. But let's really talk about it. How can I get to a place that I can really glorify God? Well, the Bible says something in Matthew, the 11th chapter. You see, again, can we glorify God without Jesus? Can we be sanctified without Jesus? Can we be justified without Jesus? So at every stage of what we're seeking to experience, we must come in contact with who? we got to come in contact with Jesus. Now look at what Jesus says. He made it easy for us. Matthew 11, and verse 28, the Bible says in Matthew 11, and verse 28, he says, do what? Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. And what does he promise? He says, and I will give you rest. I don't know about you, but I could use that rest. This is, something, this, this is a whole lot deeper than sleep. This is a peace that passes all understanding, even when the worst and the most vicious of storms of life come, that we know how to rest in the word and in the promises of God. Jesus says, look, I am the one who justifies you. I am the one who sanctifies you. I am the one that's going to enable you to glorify me. But you first have to come unto me. 
It can't happen unless that happens. Now, I'm going through this because as I talk about this for you and I, this is also going to be important for us to understand when we go to talk about this to others that know not God. You understand that? So believe it or not, this study is not just edifying for you. It is preparing us to know how to witness and minister to others. Amen? All right. So the Bible makes it clear. If Jesus is, or since Jesus is my justification, my sanctification, my glorification, then I must come unto him. He makes it clear, come unto me. He wants you to come. How does he want us to come? Hebrews 4. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews 4, you must learn and I must learn how to shut the voice of the devil down with the word of God. The devil will often speak opposite of what the Word of God says. There are some of us who sin. There are some of us who have erred. There are some of us who have fallen. And as a result of our erring and our falling, many a times we are timid before God. We run from God. I have a dear brother of mine that I was privileged to minister to, got baptized, started to walk in the Lord together. He fell into sin, and he decided to run away from God and from any of God's messengers. And for up to five to seven years, literally for five to seven years, I would call him every single year, different times in the year. Hey, man, just call him to see how you're doing. Want you to know I still love you, miss you. I hope one day you'll call me back. And he never would call back. And it was only until my crisis came with my heart. And when my crisis came with my heart, and everybody heard about it, including my friend, and what happened was he would, he would go online and he would look at Facebook just to watch what's happening without letting me know. And when he saw Dwayne is in trouble, he needs a very specific surgery, and for it to be done, it has to be done out of his network, so he can't use medical coverage. Dwayne needs to come up with $86,000, and Dwayne only has a period of days to get it. So he's watching to see what happens, and when he saw in 12 days, over $86,000 was raised. 12 days. He saw the report. The surgery went well. Dr. Banzel, who said very clearly, heart valve irreparable. I brought it to my surgeon. I said, surgeon, the cardiologist said irreparable. What do you say? He said, I get the last say. I said, okay, we go to him, we show it to him, he looks at the report, he says, Dwayne, your valves are in bad shape. He says, I cannot repair this. So now the surgeon says he can't repair it. My wife and I are looking at each other and we're in despair. We're saying, Lord, we believed you. We trusted your words. We believe you sent us to this surgeon. We believe you brought us to this individual. But now he's telling us he can't do what you told us he was going to do. Father, what do you want us to do? And the Lord said, tell him a story. And so I looked at my surgeon. I said, sir, can I tell you a story? He said, yes. I said, there was a time that there was a man who went to London. And when he went to London, he uh, went to bed, getting ready to preach that Sabbath morning. And he went to bed Friday night, and his heart stopped. And the doctor looked at me, and he was just looking, and his wife was in the room, and my wife. And I said, his heart just stopped. I said, doctor, he did not get oxygen to his brain for over 30 minutes. What's the prognosis? He said, death. No one can live that long without getting oxygen to their brain. No one. All the medical records say vegetable or dead. I said, I agree. I said, but the Bible lets us know that which is impossible with man is possible with God. I said, do you know that that same man is going to be here Monday for my surgery to pray with all of us and to pray with you? And I'll let you see for yourself that he is in sound mind and sound body. And I told that doctor, I said, God did a miracle on behalf of that man. Do you believe God can do a miracle with your hands on behalf of my heart? And he looked down, and he looked at the screen with my heart on it. He looked down, and he looked again. And he said, I think we can do it. And I said, I know you can do it. 
I know you can. You just got to put your trust in him. He told my wife and I, he says, I don't have your faith. Do you know Christ Object Lesson says sometimes when we come in contact with people, we have to give them our faith, our courage, our strength. I said, that's all right. You don't have to have the faith. I'm letting you know that I'll give you mine. You can do this. Brothers and sisters, it's been seven months. I got a text yesterday from my cardiologist. He said, Mr. Lemon, your heart is doing fantastic. That which is impossible with man is possible with God. Vernon saw that, my friend. And when he saw that, he said, man, I need to come back. He said, I need to come back to Jesus. He called me, Dwayne, listen, man, I've been watching what's been going on with you. And now Vernon and I have been studying and getting back to the body. He wants to get rebaptized, and by God's grace, I'm going to be going there to be privileged to rebaptize him. My brothers and sisters, God can do anything. God is our justification. He is our sanctification. He is our glorification. He says, come unto me. But when we come unto him, how do we come unto him? Hebrews chapter 4. What does the Bible say? The Bible says in Hebrews 4, come unto me, yes, but look at what it says here in Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. The Bible says in Hebrews 4, 14 through 16, seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Verse 16, let us therefore come how? Boldly unto the throne of grace, boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. Jesus makes it clear, I am your justification. I am your sanctification. I am your glorification. Therefore, come unto me. And when you fall into sin and you are timid and feeling broken, he says, don't let that stop you. Don't just come. Come how? Come boldly. Come boldly. This is very different from what the human mind tells you. The more we sin, we get all ashamed and we don't want to come to God. Now, sin is shameful, but my brothers and sisters, it's not so shameful that we can't come to the only one who can cleanse us from sin. That's the lie the devil wants us to believe, is that we have fallen into such a shameful condition that we can't even come to God anymore with true contrition. Jesus says, come unto me, and when you come, Come boldly because right now I sit on a throne filled with grace. Amen. That's what's in that most holy place. Yes, there's a law of God, but I praise the Lord that there's a mercy seat above that law. And grace and mercy are very synonymous in the Bible. And so the first step is come unto him. Now, why is this important? Because go to Matthew 19. Watch this. In Matthew 19, we need to understand, if I'm going to glorify God, I need to be sanctified by God. If I'm going to be sanctified by God, I need to be justified by God. But if I'm going to be justified by God, I have to come to him. And when I come to him, do not come timidly. Come boldly. Don't waste time ruminating and, and contemplating, should I come to him? I'm so sinful. I'm so wretched. I messed up so much. Oh, man, I'm an evangelist. And how could it be that I failed? No, don't let any of that stuff get in the way. Jesus says, you come boldly to me. Once you see your sin and you see that I'm the only one that can clean you up from it, he says, come boldly unto me that I might clean you up and get you right. And so it is that the Bible says in Matthew 19, an incredible story that gives relevance to why I'm teaching this even to the remnant Advent band. The Bible says in Matthew 19 that a man came to Jesus. And I want you to notice how he came. The Bible says in Matthew 19 and verse 16, when you're there, please let me know by saying amen. The Bible says in Matthew 19 and verse 16, and behold, one came and said unto him, good master, what was his question? He is, I, I wish he would have said, what shall I do? I wish that's what the verse says. That's not what the verse says, does it? He didn't say, what shall I do? He said, what good thing shall I do? That I might be what? 
that I might have eternal life. Do you know that there are a lot of people, even in the Seventh-day Adventist church, that are still making that mistake? Did he come to God? Did he come to God? Yes, he did. Did he come correct? No, he did not. Why? Because he wanted to know what work can I do to have eternal life. Now, my brothers and sisters, you already know what Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Then it says, not of works, lest any man should boast. If I can do a good thing and get salvation, God owes me. God is indebted to me. You understand that? There are a lot of us that actually still have a very works-oriented approach to God. And how you approach God is more than likely how you function in God and more than likely how you'll end up leaving God. This man came thinking, what works can I do that I might have a gift that you offer humanity? Follow that? What works can I do that I might have the gift that you offer humanity? Is eternal life a gift? The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. But he didn't want the gift. He wanted to work his way in. You follow that? What work can I do? So then Jesus starts showing him. You know the story, I would imagine. If you don't, just keep reading the verses. Jesus shows his brother. He says, well, okay, keep the commandments. He answers his question. He says, well, all this I've done for my youth up. Jesus says, really? Okay. And then he goes ahead and gives him another one. And how he came to Christ, ultimately, that's how he left Christ. Came in focused on his works. He left focused on his works. Jesus said, you got to give up some of your works. You got to give up some of that fruit of your works. All those riches that you've made. All that money, all those things that are so precious to you. I need you to give all of that up and follow me. Those riches came as a result of his works. He came to God with a works orientation, to, trying to receive salvation, and he left God focused on his works. And he missed the gift. I wonder if there are Seventh-day Adventists that are like that. I wonder if there are some of us who make that same vicious mistake like this brother made. You see, one of the great reasons, let me bottom line it, one of the great reasons why many of us cannot presently and probably will not eternally glorify God is because we came to him wrong and we're functioning in him wrong right now. How did you come to Jesus? How did you come to him? Because however you came to him, maybe that's how you're still functioning in him right now, and maybe that's why we're missing a lot of the key powerful blessings that God wants to give us, including true justification, sanctification, and glorification. How did you come to him? Well, I would imagine we would definitely run out of Sabbath school time if we were to go ahead, detail, and point by point, person by person, and go into how we came to him. And so I'm just going to show you the right way to come to him. Is that all right? Because if, 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 if we can understand the right way to come to him, then we know the right way to walk in him. And if we know the right way to walk in him, watch these words. I'm using a lot of deliberate words. If we know how to come, that's a deliberate word. If we know how to come to him, then we know how to walk. That's a deliberate word. Then we know how to walk in him. And if we know how to walk in him, we will know how to be justified in him, sanctified in him, and glorify him. Go to the book of Leviticus chapter 4. Leviticus, the fourth chapter. It's a beautiful, beautiful breakdown of how we can come to God. And I really wish that we had the time during our Sabbath school to go, you know, point by point. I'm a point by point preacher. I like to go through things point by point. I love definition of terms. I like studying verse by verse. We won't be able to exhaust it, but you can in your spare time. But I want you to look at Leviticus 4, and we're going to look at verses 27 to 31. And I want you to watch it very carefully. In Leviticus 4, 27 
to 31. What I'll do is I'll read verse 27, you'll do 28, I'll do 29, and we'll take it down to 31. All right. If you're there, please say amen. The Bible says in verse 27, And if any one of the common people sin through ignorance while he doeth somewhat against any of the commandments of the Lord concerning things which ought not to be done and be guilty, go ahead, Verse 29, and he shall lay his hand upon the head of the sin offering and slay the sin offering in the place of the burnt offering. Very good. Verse 31, and he shall take away all the fat thereof as the fat is taken away from off the sacrifice of peace offerings and the priest shall burn it upon the altar for a sweet savor unto the Lord, and the priest shall make an atonement for him, and it shall be what? It shall be forgiven him. Praise God. This is how, this is how common people were supposed to come to Jesus. This is how the common man, the common woman, can we say we're common? Is that all right? This would be in contrast to like the priests and kings and all these things. So these are the common folks. So let's go ahead and let's call ourselves common folks for a minute. Let's be okay with that term. He says, if any of the common people sin through ignorance or if they have a knowledge of God's commandments and they realize they broke it, then he says what they need to do is they need to bring an offering. Now, if we were to study the principles of type and anti-type, we know that the offering, the lamb, the, without blemish, all these things, they represent Jesus. Okay, let me just say that in short. If you need a study on that, we can study it. But it represents Jesus, the atonement, the substitute. And here it is that they had to find one because we know that we are with blemish. We're, we're loaded with blemishes. So we could never present ourselves before God and atone for ourselves. So we needed one without blemish, without spot, without sin. And that is none other than Jesus. That same Hebrews 4, we just read it. Tempted in all points, yet without sin. Now, when Jesus, we come to him, I believe that according to these verses, we come to him by faith. What do you think? You want to know why I especially believe this? Because there are no works be between verse 27 and 29 that the people of God do. There are no works of the law that the people of God do between verses 27 and 29. You can read it and study it through and through. And you can look at all the type and anti-type you choose. They are wholly leaning on the substitute and the priest. I love verse 30 because look at what it said in verse 30. It said, and the priest shall take of the blood thereof with his finger and put it upon the horns of the altar of burnt offering and shall pour out the blood thereof at the bottom of the altar. You know what I like about this verse? Have, did you notice that the sinner disappears? Everything's focused on the priest now. First it was the sinner. The sinner has to see their sin. The sinner has to find the substitute. The sinner has to make sure that they go and bring it before the altar. The sinner has to take the knife and run it across the substitute's throat. The sinner has to do that. Today, in antitype, it's an acknowledgement. It is us seeing Christ, understanding the atoning work that he did on our behalf going before him, putting our faith in his ability to not only forgive us, but to pardon us, to take away our sins because of his grace towards us. And when we exercise faith in that substitute and put our trust in the priest to make an atonement for us, it says that we are forgiven. Is that right? Now, depending on what kind of seven-day Adventism you grew up with or you've been studying, depending on who you listen to on YouTube or whatever other network, you might have a different picture of justification by faith. But justification by faith, according to the Scripture, according to the storyline of what we're reading, there is no human work. There is no human obedience to God's law by which puts us in a place that we are justified. Does anybody know what the word justified means, by the way? Right. To be made right with God. 
There's nothing we're doing. There's no work that we are doing that is putting us in a right position with God. Because once that happens, he owes us. Not of works, lest any man should boast. This does not negate works. But we got to put works in their proper place. Because depending on how you come to God is how you'll walk in God and how your end result will more than likely be with God except there be a miraculous dynamic change. And so the Lord shows us when we come to him, we come to him by faith. Resting completely upon the blood of the lamb and the atoning work of the priest. In the 1888 Messages, page 898, paragraph 2, it says pardon and justification are one of the same thing. Did you catch that? Let me repeat that. In the 1888 writings, 800, page 898, paragraph 2, it says pardon and justification are one and the same thing. So whenever you read about forgiveness, you're reading about pardon. When you're reading about pardon, you're reading about justification. God making us right with him. And we come to him resting wholly upon faith in his power and his ability to work something in our hearts by which we are made right with him. I don't know about you, but I'm realizing that we got some deep-rooted problems deep down inside of our hearts that many of us struggle with believing, how can you change me? How can you get me to a place that my mind is in harmony with your mind? And God says, it is a miracle. I'll tell you that right now. It's a miracle that sinful man can have the mind of Christ. That is nothing short of a miracle. But thank God it's possible. And through the righteous merits of Jesus Christ, we are enabled. Now watch this. We come to God totally exercising faith. Lord, I'm in a certain condition that I cannot deliver myself from. But you have power to deliver me. You have sent your son to do everything that it takes that I might be delivered. And if I rest my trust in your son's power to not only pardon me, but also to empower me. Now watch this. How do we come to God? We come to him by faith. And when we come to him by faith, resting our trust in the promises, the merits, and the power of Jesus Christ. When we come to him like that, I wonder how he wants us to walk in him. Go to the book of Colossians chapter 2. In Colossians chapter 2, notice what the Bible says. Colossians, we're looking at chapter 2 now. In Colossians, the second chapter, I want you to see what the Apostle Paul says as we consider verse 6. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 6. And when you get there, please let me know by saying amen. Notice what the Bible says. In Colossians 2 verse 6, it says, As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, what should we do? So walk ye in him. How do we receive him? We came to him by faith, so how should we walk? By faith and not by, by sight. You get that? God makes it clear. As you receive Christ, that's now how I want you to walk in him. So the same way that we came to him with complete acknowledgement, I cannot do this. I cannot pardon myself. I cannot save myself. There is no work that I can bring of myself to you that I can present myself so that you can owe me the thing that I want the most, which is the gift of salvation. We come to him understanding it is wholly upon the merits of your son. That's the only way that I can actually be made right. So we rest our faith upon the merits of Christ and his atoning work that what you have done for me is enough to pardon me. Now watch this. The Bible says, all right, good. As you came to him recognizing your sin, seeing your guilt, resting upon the merits of Christ for pardon. Now it says, now as you've received Christ Jesus, I want you to walk in Christ the same way, the same way, the same way. Well, what does that mean? Well, the Bible makes it very clear. 
1 John chapter 2. Go there. In 1 John, the second chapter, notice what the Bible says next now. In 1 John chapter 2, bring out a couple more points. 1 John chapter 2, notice what it says in verse 6. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 6. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 6, He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk even as he walked. Now, my brothers and sisters, when you look at the life of Jesus, is that a tall order? That God says, I want you to live the life that my son lived. The Bible says, as he walked, I want you to walk. This walk I can only do by faith. I can't do it by works. Because have you ever tried living a Christ-like life by your efforts? Have you ever tried it? Boy, if we ever come in acquaintance with that word failure. When we try in and of ourselves to do the very works in life and live the lifestyle of Jesus, it feels like a mere impossibility. It feels like a mere impossibility. And that's why you know we're going to also need to exercise in our walk with him? Faith. This faith is not just in his pardoning power. This faith is also in the context of his empowering. The same faith that I exercise to believe that I can't make myself right with you, but you can because of your grace and power and merits, is the same faith now that I'm going to come to Jesus to say, I can't live this righteous life without you. Therefore, I'm going to rest my faith in your grace and merits, that whatever you bid me to do, I am trusting you have enabled me to do it, so in your strength, I will obey. And you will find that if we approach God like that, you'll have far more success in your life of obedience. But here's the key point. Here's the key point. Here's the crux right here. I remember reading Testimonies to Ministers and Gospel Workers, page 456, and it made a statement. And the statement said, what is justification by faith? And it said this, it is the work of God in laying the glory of man in the dust and doing for man that which it is not in his power to do for himself. Now watch this very carefully as we're closing. When you think of how we come to God and are justified, we understand that God is doing something for us that we have no power to do of ourselves. Do you know that justification by faith cannot work until we recognize we can't do it? It can't work. We can't do it until I can see that this is something that only God can do and God can accomplish. But here's the part that we often miss. The question was asked, what is justification by faith? The answer was given. It is the work of God in laying the glory of man in the dust. Then it says, and that God will do for man that which he cannot do for himself. So you ever wonder, Lord, I realize I can't do it. Lord, I realize I can't do it. But why is it that even though I realize I can't do it, I'm still not doing it? You know why? Because God says because you missed the first work. Your glory must be laid in the dust. My glory must be laid in the dust. You see, no one will experience justification no one will experience sanctification, and no one definitely will experience glorification if they're still holding on to some of their own glory. When we talk about how can I give glory to God, the first step is you must let God grind to dust your glory. You must let God grind yourself, your glory, into the dust which means you cannot come to God with anything on your agenda. You cannot come to God and say, okay, Lord, this is how we're going to do it. 
You cannot come to God and hold on to a little bit of your accolades while you're trying to hold on to some of Christ's accolades. You and I must realize that everything that we have ever done, everything that we will ever do, everything that we will ever accomplish had nothing to do with you, had nothing to do with me. If there's one thing that the Bible makes very clear and the Bible never speaks about is the greatness of man. It doesn't speak about it. We must cooperate with Jesus in such a way that we realize everything that I've been giving myself credit for. There's some mothers who think they're great mothers. Let me tell you something. You're not a great mother. I'm not a great father. I'm not a great husband. You're not a great wife. I'm not a great preacher or evangelist. We are not a great anything. All greatness belongs to God. Any good that you did in your home in the name of motherhood, any good that you did in your home in the name of fatherhood, any good that you've done in your life as a result of being a husband or a wife, any good that you've ever done in the name and the context of evangelism is wholly, completely, absolutely because of God and his grace. Now, you know, what, you know what's so sad? We are at the conclusion of our study, but I promise you, this point I just made is worthy of meditation because you would be amazed at how bent we are of finding some way to acknowledge our greatness. It is the greatest disease, it is the greatest poison that we as human beings suffer with. We demonstrate it sometimes in the vehicles we buy. We demonstrate it sometimes in the clothes we wear. We demonstrate it sometimes in the classes that we teach. You can see human glory rise up very easily and, oh, I can be a very nice, humble man until you cross me. Cross me and get me upset. Say something that embarrasses me. And you might see some of that human self-glory just rise up and come out. There's still a tremendous lesson we all need to learn at the foot of the cross. We'll talk a little bit more about this at our 11 o'clock study. But the first lesson that we need to understand in our conclusion of our Sabbath school, before there's glorification, there's sanctification. Before sanctification, there's justification. The only way we can be justified, we must come unto him. And when we come unto him, we are to come boldly. But the problem is most people are coming to him wrong. And they're coming to him based on some level of work, glory, of self-orientation that we bring into Christianity. Therefore, God had to remind us how we come to him, recognizing all glory has to be laid in the dust. There is nothing that you and I can do or ever will do that will give us credit before heaven. Did you know Job even had a problem understanding this? When Job went through all his drama, Job says, I understand if I didn't feed the homeless. I understand if I didn't clothe the naked. I understand if I didn't. He literally threw that back at God, and he did that. And boy, by the time you get to Job, what is it? I think it's Job 38, 39. God was just listening. Job was like, oh, Lord, I, I understand. If I, if I didn't do all these things, I understand why I'm suffering. But I did do all these things. Why am I suffering? Job challenged God. He didn't disrespect him, but he was at such a desperate place because of his friends. Y'all need to catch that. Job was strong when he stood by himself. Job was strong when even his wife rebuked him, but it was his friends that almost derailed him. And Job gets to a place that he's saying, Lord, I've done so much good. Why am I going through all this? And when God finished listening to him, you should read how God responded. God says, okay, you finished talking, Job? It's my turn to talk. Who made man's mouth, Job? Job, who, and I mean, when God give you a spanking, whew, that thing will fix you right. And God began to get on him and say, Job, who has done this? Job was looking to his works. Job actually started saying, look at all these things I'm doing. Why am I going through this? And he didn't understand God was allowing him to go through it for his glory. So if Job could make that mistake, you think we could probably make that mistake? That we look to our works, our glory? Yes. My brothers and sisters, the first lesson we must learn, if we are going to glorify God, we must cease the language 
of lifting up and glorifying ourselves in those little subtle as, as well as very forthright, bold ways. We must get to a place that we understand our nothingness. For that's the only time we can truly understand God's greatness. Question for you. Did you understand the study thus far this morning? Amen? Amen. Do you understand it? Amen? We're going to go ahead and we're going to continue on that. And with that being stated, let's close with a word of prayer. And then we will progress throughout the remainder of our day. Let us pray. Loving Father, we are so grateful that we have the privilege to give thee glory. But Lord, it's going to take a lot more than we think because no man can of himself truly deny himself. It's a power that you give to all of us that if we could simply see that power for what it is, oh God, we can see true change in our lives. Lord, forgive us for the several ways that we have directly and perhaps for the majority of us indirectly have lifted up ourselves and shown forth our glory as the reason why we have breath of life, health, strength, or any of these blessings of heaven. Forgive us, Lord, for the way that we've come to you. Teach us, dear God, how to really allow you to lay our glory in the dust so finally you can do for us that which it is impossible for us to do for ourselves. In Jesus' name, amen.